Thank you all. It's, it's really great to be here. I, um, I got talked into doing this by uh, Tim Draper. I ran into him at a party over the holidays, and he was telling me about all the great students that are coming to his university and, and really wanted me to spend some time with you and talk about what we do, but also what we're seeing in the startup world and how we make our investment decisions and what Salesforce, how Salesforce thinks about innovation, um, which I think would be pretty ha helpful to all of you. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, just to touch upon briefly, is that I also worked at a startup before I joined Salesforce, this company called Ingenio, and I went through the ups and downs of being at a startup. We were a few days from going bankrupt, saved the company, uh, turned it around, and, um, and got everything back on track to the point that we were able to actually sell the company to AT&T for $250 million. So it's a pretty amazing success story, and I think a lot of the lessons that I learned in that I've applied to my job at Salesforce. Um, I joined Salesforce in 2005 when we had about 850 employees and about 300 million in revenue. And um, today uh, we are a lot bigger. So um, we ended last year at 6.67 billion in revenue. We're projecting over 8 billion in revenue for this year. We have 20,000 employees at the company. Um, we've uh, been, a, we're now part of the Fortune 500. We've won a lot of really prestigious awards from various, uh, various uh, uh, important um, publications, including one I'm very proud of, which is being the most innovative company for, we were the most innovative companies for four years in a row, and I think last year we were second or third. And so, um, this, I've, I've been there now 11 years. This is actually an unbelievable ride, and I hope all of you get to experience something like this, to go from a sort of a moderate-sized company to, to a behemoth as we are now. And it's, it's really fun, it's really challenging, and, uh, and I want to tell you how we got there. So, um, in, for those of you that don't know what we do, we sell um, a variety of different products. So, our, we're best known for our customer relationship management products, so sales, sales uh, force automation, which we call the sales cloud. We deliver everything um, as a service over the internet in, in, in the cloud, and so all our business units are called clouds. So we have the sales cloud, we have the service cloud for managing a large call center. And both of those are focused on connecting with your customers in a whole new way. We have the marketing cloud, which was done primarily built through acquisitions, and that's about building one-to-one -one customer journeys. We have the, and also, um, we have the analytics cloud, the IoT cloud, which is about um, getting smarter about your customers. And then we have the app cloud, um, which is our platform, essentially, both Force.com and Heroku, where you can build your business and run your business from your phone. Um, so Alex Dayon is our head of products and actually joined us from an acquisition. And so I run all M&A at Salesforce, and he is really like the, pro this is the prototype of the best acquisition you could possibly do. We paid $31 million for his company in uh, 2008, and today that business is really the foundation for our service cloud, which is a $2 billion business, and the CEO of Instranet, that was his company, is now running all of our products. So that's kind of the best you can do in the M&A world in terms of acquisitions. We've had a lot of other acquisitions that have been less successful than that. But um, this is just a quote from Alex about, um, about what we do, how we think about in innovation. And you know, our company has always approached innovation as being really one of the most important values of the company and being really paranoid about what's coming up in other areas, never getting uh, too complacent with our success but really looking at all the different um, developments going on in the software industry and making sure that we have a role in that. And sometimes that, that will mean that we're going to be developing new products and we're going to be, um, uh, you know, some, some of the products we've developed, for example, are Chatter, which, which is like a great example of how we looked at what was going on with Facebook and we thought, wow, we need an enterprise version of that and um, to allow people who work in a company to collaborate with one another. Um, we've built things like, um, um, 
like, uh, like the sales cloud from the ground up, really, where we have the best collection of, of different software packages to really run your entire sales force on a global level, and that was all built internally. But then we've had to supplement with acquisitions to make sure that we're always staying ahead of the game and making sure that we can't get um, disrupted like we disrupted some of the old legacy players like Siebel, for example. So this is an example of how we have applied different acquisitions to help bolster each of our clouds. And uh, Marketing Cloud is entirely made up of acquisitions, but the others are just um, are really additive to what we've, we've built internally other than maybe the analytics cloud is pr predominantly built on acquisitions as well. Heroku, which is a big foundation of our platform, is another acquisition. But, um, but this gives you a sense of some of the things that we're doing. Now, over the last year, we've bought uh, eight companies, and a uh, few of those have been in the deep learning and machine learning artificial intelligence space. So MetaMind and Prediction.io are examples of that. Tempo, uh, which is a smart calendar up there, is another example. Um, but this is an area that we're investing very heavily in because um, you know, we really do see intelligence and, um, and machine learning as the future of the software industry. And so being able to proactively um, suggest what people should be doing or just having a machine do it. Like that's where we really think the whole industry is going. And so we're trying to apply all of these, all of, all to every one of our clouds, we're applying an intelligence layer to it. Um, we do four types of acquisitions. Um, the large scale public companies where you're really buying a business. And you do this when you want to enter a new market. And so Exact Target was one of the leaders in marketing automation. We bought the company in 2013. This will be a billion dollar business for us this year. Um, we do strategic product adjacencies, which are you know, examples of, of what I talked about on the last slide, where we help, there is an existing cloud and we help bolster it with an acquisition. Um, we have a whole initiative around services because we're now, now you know, have so many customers that are these large global 2,000 customers, massive businesses, and they want help in trying to figure out how to digitally transform themselves so that they don't get disrupted by the next generation of companies. And so we're helping them think through that with some services acquisitions that we do. And you know, one of the issues that, that you would find if you work in an enterprise company where you're servicing all these large customers is that you really do need a professional services arm to go along with the software sales. It's not just enough to sell your software. You actually have to show people how to use it, how to be more effective with it, what, and you know, help them transform their businesses. So that's why we've done a few acquisitions there. And then we do um, uh, all the time, like almost you know, one a quarter, we do a technology tuck-in, where it's usually we're buying technology that can help a product, we're bringing in a really talented team of people, um, and we do quite a few of those. Okay, um, so then I have ventures. So the other part of my job is before you want to buy a company, you might want to invest in them. Or you may have no intention of, of buying the company, but you want to learn what's going on in the industry. You want to help a partner. Um, you want to stay attuned to the innovation that's going on out there. So we created Salesforce Ventures. We've been investing for seven years. Um, we have 162 companies in our portfolio. We're one of the most active corporate tech investors. And um, you know, this is part of the corporate development group. And so we, we keep it, it's not a separate fund. It's very strategically related to Salesforce. We only invest in companies that relate to our business. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we give them a lot of help. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so why, you know, why do we do this? We're really trying to grow an ecosystem um, and help uh, the company grow as a result of, of building this ecosystem because we're providing more integrated solutions to all of our customers. And so um, you know, our goal is really to increase the cloud adoption, accelerate the momentum of, of not just our technologies, but the cloud as a whole. Um, we uh, 
sometimes use investments to access new markets. This is a huge part of why we make investments is that there's this new area coming up in the software industry. You don't really understand it, but we want to make sure that we have a very good sense and provide, provide that, that data to our product teams so that they can think about this technology and think about how we might want to leverage it in our own products and learn from the teams. Sometimes we make investments that are total failures, but we learn from them. And that, that's the key, the key thing. It's like you might lose all your money in investment, but at least we learned, you know, it's better to make a couple million dollar investment and see that the whole, there was a failure, that there wasn't really a great market opportunity than spend tens of millions of dollars waste, wastefully trying to get into that same opportunity. So we learn just a ton from these investments. Um, we also uh, focus a lot on philanthropy. So uh, I don't, do, how many of you know about our 111 model? No one knows, okay. Well, this is a great opportunity for me to try to sell you on having this for your own company. Um, so w when we started Salesforce, we created this uh, model, a philanthropic model where 1% of, of the equity in Salesforce was put into a foundation. And employees would give 1% of their time paid by the company to help nonprofits. We would give away 1% of our product for free to nonprofits. And, um, and we would give away um, uh, uh, a lot of our, um, our time and our energy to help you know, any nonprofits. But fast forward, you know, we've been in business now 16 years. We've now given out over $100 million in grants. Employees have donated um, over a million hours of time. We have 28,000 nonprofits that run on Salesforce for free. And it's really making a big difference. So we're encouraging our whole venture program, uh, all the portfolio companies to adopt a similar model. We have 48 of them that have adopted it. This is the sort of thing that, you know, when you're hiring uh, people of your generation and millennials, you know, this is what they expect their companies to do. And, um, you know, we can really make a big difference in the world if everybody contributes back like this. So hopefully that resonates for you as you think about starting your own companies. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. Um, why would companies take money from us? Um, well, three things. We give them tremendous access to our ecosystem of partners, to our executives, our product teams. We make VC introductions for them. We give them a lot of advice. We've learned so much over the years and made many mistakes, and we can help advise companies to, to make sure they don't make the same mistakes, uh, help them think about their technology scalability, reliability, all the infrastructure lessons that we've learned from the billions of transactions that we have to serve every day. Um, and it's obviously a lot of, it gives a lot of credibility if you're selling into the enterprise and selling to our customer base to have an investment from us. Um, as I mentioned, we invest all over the world. Um, I've got a full-time um, head that works for me in London who does our European investments and then one in Tokyo who does our Japanese investments. It turns out Japan is a great market for cloud computing really, really high adoption for cloud, for mobility, for social technologies. And so um, we've found some amazing companies there. And that's probably one of the most, um, the best returns from our portfolio overall, if you just have to pick a region, are actually in Japan, um, which probably surprises a lot of you. And um, we do most of our investing though in the Bay Area, 72 companies in the Bay Area. Yeah, why not South, South America? Um, you know, it's, it's really because our business is not so big in South America. We, we try to piggyback off of uh, the business of Salesforce as a whole because, we're, again, we're about building that ecosystem of partners and, custom, and helping customers buy more. And our business just isn't as developed down here. And so... A lot of people use Heroku and other people use Salesforce. Yeah, well, they don't pay a lot of money for it. I think that's the thing is we, one of the big, here's one of the big lessons that we learned early on is we used to peanut butter our international um, investments all around the world and we'd have a little of this and a little of that in every country. And we realized that it, 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 it's pretty important to have scale. Like you wanna have a hub of activity where you have salespeople, where you have pre-sales people, you've got, 
your uh, software, software engineers, where you can have marketing people, sales, uh, salespeople, um, and our executives would go. And so we decided to focus on nine countries, essentially, and we put, you know, 98% of our investment goes into those nine countries. Um, and those are the nine markets that are the best for enterprise software. So that would be the US, Canada, UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, um, uh, Japan, Australia, and, um, and I guess the Nordics would probably be next. But Latin America's not on that list. If there was a 10th country, it would be Brazil. Um, but we only really focus on nine. <laughs> yeah. That would be the ten actually that would be the tenth country, but we really only focus on nine. So okay. Um, so this was kind of cool. Uh, we we there was a, a um, some research done on who's the most active VC in enterprise software, and we were number four on the list, even with all these top tier firms. So that was very exciting for us. Um, but even more exciting is that we have a lot of potential IPOs that are getting ready. A lot, of, a lot of investments that we've made in companies over the years that we think will go public soon. Um, and uh, you know, we think about investments the same way, it's sort of very similar to the chart I showed you on acquisitions, is that we need an executive sponsor who um, will ra you know, raise their hand internally and say, this company, this technology is really important and I'm gonna help them. And, um, and then they sponsor the investment. And, uh, and we have that for every one of these companies. And we, they're basically, all, all these companies are tied to a cloud. Um, we've done, as you can see, because the bulk of our business is in sales, services, marketing. That's where most of our investments have been made. And then we have a series of, of businesses over here that are kind of not less related to our company, but they might be built on our platform, or there's some important partner, or they're a very hot company like Stripe that we work with in some cases, and we want to have a piece of that. So I don't know if any of you, did any of you see 60 Minutes last night and see, there's a, it was a great 60 Minutes on FinTech, and Stripe was featured. Um, but any questions on this slide? Yes. How do you determine like which companies are investable rather than like ones you guys would just purchase outright? Um, that is a great question and one we spend a lot of time on. So every probably two to three times a year, I meet with one of the leaders of, of these business units that we call clouds. And we talk about their whole roadmap strategy for the next three years and where they want to build, buy, or partner. And um, when they think about the buy versus partner, they may not know. Like it might be an area, it's a young area, we think it's important. The companies in the space though are all really small and we just don't know if there's a lot of revenue there. So why don't we start by partnering with them and investing in them and if they do well, then we can buy it later. We'll pay more, but you know where we are, one of the challenges that I have right now is that where we are as a company eight billion in revenue this year. If you're not buying a business that's gonna be a hundred million in revenue very quickly, it just doesn't mean anything to the company. And so we really need to focus on making sure that we're, um, we're spending our money wisely and that we're buying companies that will really move the needle for us. And that, this is one of the challenges you have as the company grows. Um, when I started in 2005, we were not thinking about $100 million businesses. We were thinking about $10 million businesses. It just, the scale was just completely different. Okay. Yes? Are you investing in decentralized applications? Um, I'm gonna, it's a good segue. This is, um, this is kind of where we're spending most of our time investing right now. So um, as I mentioned, you know, predictive intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning is one area that we're, we're really looking hard at. And it applies to every business that there is. Um, big data and data integration, this is hugely important for um, cloud services. So you, know, you need to have all these apps need to be able to communicate with e each other and pass data back and forth between them in a very secure way. 
And you know, the old um, legacy uh, businesses that are all built on premise behind a firewall, you know, that's not where the world is going. The world is going in this direction where a company will buy you know, hundreds of applications and they all need to integrate and move information back and forth among them in a very secure way. So this data integration, this is a huge business and, and, and something that a lot of companies are trying to solve in many different ways. Um, also being able to mine a lot of data and extract uh, valuable insights out of it is very important. Um, we think every operation in the company is all moving to the cloud, so spending time there. Um, mobility is a huge theme for everything that we do, and so we always think about when we're developing our products of trying to be mobile first, and so we're investing in a number of companies that are helping mobility in different ways. Um, on the business B2D side, which is business to developer, this is, these are companies that you know, create like a messaging layer or a payments layer that every application can tap into so that if you're developers, you don't have to build it yourself. Um, that's a big area of investment right now. Uh, and then verticals, like lots of vertical solutions for companies uh, in the cloud. Um, but that's, that's where we're spending most of our time. Do you see Ethereum as a, a threat to your platform? Can you say that again? Do you see Ethereum as a, a threat to your Ethereum? Yeah, so blockchain. Oh, um, I think the short answer is no. Okay. <laughs> but but I would say I you'd have to ask someone much more technical than I am that question. But uh, I think we feel pretty good about where our platform is right now. Okay. Yes. So what stage do company do you invest in? Sorry. What stage do you invest in? Oh, um, let's see if I have a slide. No, I don't have that slide. So we. Um, typically we'll invest at the first time at the Series A stage and we always, our model is to co-invest with a VC and so uh, we don't do the early stage, seed stage investing. We'll come in at the Series A, sometimes at Series B, but that's 80% of our investments start at that early stage level. Um, there are a few companies that we've come in at the Series C and D level, but those tend to be larger, more established partners. Um, but that's a much smaller percentage of what we do. And then in terms of investment size, um, we basically, because we invest off our balance sheet and we worry about making sure we're not, um, uh, you, if, we, if, if a company goes under and we've invested off of our balance sheet, we have to take a write-off for that company, that investment, and so we want to make sure that we apply the right level of risk um, and the, to the right dollar amount that we're investing at the stage of the company. So for a Series A investment, we're not gonna go above $2 million. For a Series B investment, we won't go above five. For um, later stage companies, we'll do larger investments, but then the risk is much less and the company has really proven itself. Um, all right, so the next section of this presentation is really about um, what's going on in the startup world right now, which I thought would really in interest you guys. Um, before I go into that, do you guys have any questions on the first part? Yes. I saw you guys invest the uh, companies only one in China. Mm -hmm. right? but, but do you think right now there is a big trend in China to, from the traditional software to go to the cloud software? It hasn't proven to be a country where people are willing to pay a lot of money for software uh, for business. And so, um, you know, we haven't yet seen a really successful cloud software company come out of China. Uh, and so I think, you know, until, I think part of it is that a lot of businesses don't want their data to be in the cloud uh, where the Chinese government can access it. And so uh, there's just, you know, companies really, they like, to, they like to do the traditional on-premise version of software. Until that changes, I don't think we're gonna do a lot of investing in China. So, yeah. uh, your company is obviously very successful right now, so I'm wondering what's the biggest challenge or biggest risk you are facing? Um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the big challenges we have is we have 20,000 employees now all over the world. 
and being able to make sure all of those employees are aligned with what our strategic goals are for the company and working towards those goals and that they feel engaged with everything that we're doing and that people are collaborating well across all those time zones and countries you know that's it's just very hard when you're so big and you know i see it on a very small scale i have a team of 20 uh, i have uh, as many people in this room i have a 27 person team actually and i have three people who are not in the country and one person who's on the East Coast. And just even being able to do team meetings and collaborate with those people who are not in San Francisco, it's hard. So doing that on a 20,000 person level, we have to really uh, work to make sure that you know, we're keeping those employees engaged and feeling a part of Salesforce and making sure that they you know, feel part of our culture too. That's, I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into a little bit what's going on in the startup world because it's really changed over the last year. And this is um, information you guys should all know um, if you're about to start a company. So um, one of the things that, that has happened is that you know, there's been too much funding. There's been sort of this massive overfunding of companies that has really driven up valuations to levels that we haven't seen in quite a while. And um, you know, companies are raising a lot of money that they use to spend on sales and marketing and uh, product development, and they have huge burn rates and are really, you know, it's unclear whether a lot of these companies are actually ever going to get to profitability. Um, and the other thing we found is that as the public markets corrected, there's a disconnect, a valuation disconnect between the valuations that public companies are getting and private companies in the same space are getting, okay? So um, the other thing that's happened is IPOs are not happening. And I'll, I'll share with you some data on that. So there are fewer IPOs. There's this valuation disconnect. Um, and what it's resulting in is it's just getting harder and harder to raise money. Um, and a lot of the rounds that we've participated in recently are actually down rounds, flat rounds. They're rounds that have a lot of structure to them. And, do you guys know what structure is in the VC context? So you have, you have super rights. So basically any investor that will invest in your company get these, um, gets you know, special, special rights that you might not have given to other investors that allow them to make more money and have more protection. And so we're see this is kind of a key theme that you're seeing. And um, you know, part of it is, goes back to this, this point about there being fewer IPOs. So um, if you just see over time, there have been fewer and fewer IPOs. And um, last year, there were only 23 IPOs. You had, like at the height of 2000, there were, you know, there were, sorry, there were uh, 350 IPOs. And it just, you know, has gone on from there gone down from there, 23 IPOs last year. There's only been one technology IPO so far this year. So this is a problem for a lot of companies and a lot of investors because it means really the path to liquidity that's open to them is M&A as an exit. And um, you know, one of the things that also has happened is the IPOs that have actually made, made it out have performed really poorly. So that one IPO, SecureWorks, that happened last week has 0% return on it. This, what this chart shows is last year there were 23 IPOs. And it, from the moment they went public, which is the gray line, to the end of the year, the best performing IPO had a 26% return over its IPO price. And the, and the worst had a, a loss of 12%. But this was like Fitbit, and Fitbit is now trading below its IPO price. So you know this was sort of a moment in time that didn't last. But you can see 2013 was probably the best year to go public, and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. So again, it may means that M&A is probably the most likely exit. Okay, so um, private company valuations uh, are going down, uh, and I think you know that. I won't spend time on that side. But investors think it's actually gonna get a lot worse. So, um, you know, 
91% of investors think this year um, the valuation environment will be either marginally down or significantly down. And this brings me to the fundamental problem. Okay, so we have unicorns and now we have unicorpses. And these are companies that have billion dollar valuations and then got sold and investors ended up pocketing all the money and employees got nothing. And so this is what you, got, what you guys need to understand is the difference between common stock and preferred stock. Do any of you in this room understand that? No. Few of you, okay. So when you start a company, you will have what's called common stock. You will have equity in the company that um, has no special rights or privileges. And that's what you will give to your employees. But when investors come in to invest, they get what's called preferred stock, which gives them the first money out. So when your company is sold, they get paid first. Um, they, also get, uh, they also get special rights to dividends and they get, um, they get a whole series of, of special rights because they're giving you their money and so they wanna make sure that they're protected. Now the reality is there's very little downside for most of these investors because almost every company that gets started, unless you know, the team is not very good, they usually get sold for about what was put into them. And so the investors very typically will at least get their money back. So the risk is very low, but often the employees walk away with nothing um, or they just get, you know, the new company that buys them gives them stock in that company, but they're starting from the ground, from ground zero. So that's what happened with Gilt and Good last year. These are companies that raised, you know, Gilt raised 270 million, they sold for 250. So the investors got 100% of the 250 and employees got zero. Good was a similar situation. There are actually a whole bunch of lawsuits around Good because people claimed, employees claimed they didn't know that this was going to happen to them. So it's one of the things you have to think about. I think a lot of founders are very naive about this point and they freely take money and they focus on the valuation. Oh, you know, I have a $100 million valuation. I have a $500 million valuation. Well, you don't. That's the valuation of the preferred stock that investors are putting in. But it's not really the valuation of what you have. And so it's just something you have to think about. And this is important uh, when we get to the M&A context in a second. I'm going to go through some data for you first. So if you, you know, CB Insights did a good study of the companies that started in um, 2009. There were 1,027 uh, seed or VC-backed tech companies that started in 2009. Of those, 411 were able to raise a second round, 232 a third round, and so on, until you get nine that were able to raise a sixth round, had a billion dollar valuation, and that included Uber, Slack, and Instagram. It was a very special group of, of companies. But there were, you know, a thousand companies that really didn't get to that level. And of those, 77% of the thousand are either dead or walking dead. So it just goes to show you like that it's not, this is really, really, really hard to do. And so you have to focus on the right things and you have to focus on building a business and not building a feature. And you have to make sure that you're not raising too much money and, and wasting too much money because that just kills you in the M&A scenario because most companies are acquired, they don't go public. And so, you know, these are the sorts of things you have to think about. If you look at last year, there were only five private software companies that were sold for more than $500 million. And the $500 million number is important because that means everyone made money. Like, that means the employees were happy, the founders were happy. That's like a really nice meaty M&A return. Whereas like, you know, you get into the gilts of the world and you, you know, that, that was a 270 million exit. You see that there wasn't really enough to go beyond the investors. Because it doesn't take $500 million to build a great company. And that's, that's why, you know, I use that as kind of the benchmark of like where people should be happy and they made money. But there were only five of those exits last year. And then this year, there have been three, but these are all public companies, actually. So Cven, Textura, and Opower, which was announced today, these are all public companies. 
the IPO. So, um, so you, just to give you a sense of just how few large deals there are. And you know, I told you we bought eight companies last year. Um, this you can see what some of the other large acquirers in enterprise software are doing. And you know, there was a lot of, of M&A activity in 2012 and 2013. You can see what these companies were spending billions of dollars on M&A. And, um, and then that continued into 2014. Concur, SAP buying Concur was the largest enterprise uh, sale that we've seen. Um, and then <coughs> it really slowed down a lot in 2015. And you can see the dollars spent by these large acquirers just got smaller and smaller. And then in 2016, it's starting to pick up again. But again, it's not big, they're not big exits for, um, for any of these companies. So, um, you know, the other thing we've seen is that I, I talked about the disconnect in the public markets on valuations. So 2014, the companies in our space, uh, which is cloud, enterprise cloud SaaS companies, were trading at the height and then it's gone down from there. And then there was a big correction that happened this year. And we're now trading like kind of near the historical mean of four times revenue. Okay. So this is my last slide. And this is just explaining a little bit of what we, we see happening next. So um, on the private side, companies really need to focus on controlling their burn rate and sustaining themselves. Um, you know, there's going to be a, you're not necessarily a winner take all um, phenomenon, but it's not realistic for the same type of company to just get tons of funding that does the same thing as another. There will, you'll see one or two winners in every space. Um, there are going to be a lot more flat rounds, down rounds, and lots of these structured deals to raise money. On the public side, you know, we have to be very valuation sensitive when we're buying companies because uh, we, get, we get valued by our investors based on our profitability. So we can't acquire a company with a large burn rate. Um, and, um, and so you know, you're going to just continue to see burn rates challenging feasibility for M&A and a valuation uh, crunch where oftentimes M&A is going to happen at a lower price than what the last round value was. Um, OK. So I loaded you up with a ton of information. And uh, I hope that was helpful, but I, I wanted to answer any questions about that. Yeah, when you guys uh, buy some of the companies, um, do you guys integrate those teams into Salesforce, or you guys completely take over? How does that work? We do it in different ways. Um, I think it, it's very case specific, but oftentimes, you know, we'll buy a business where it's a really well-run company. They're, they are sort of, can be sort of self-contained and all stay together. And uh, just the CEO of that company will report to one of our executives and he can continue to manage his business. Um, we always, for every acquisition, we take over their finance function, legal, HR, you know, the back office pieces credit and collections, things like that. So that always gets integrated immediately. But everything else can sometimes stay in a contained unit. Relate IQ is a great example of that. We bought, that's a company in Palo Alto we bought. It's been renamed as Salesforce IQ. And it's, a, um, uh, it's our small business solution now for CRM. Uh, all you know, available on your mobile phone. It's really an amazing product, actually. If you're a, when you start your company, look at at buying Salesforce IQ, because it's really all you need um, for managing your sales. And um, we've kept them by themselves in Palo Alto. But other companies, um, which aren't really like a self-contained business, will integrate them all into our functions immediately. Um, so I know you operate on a much larger scale than any of us are at. Um, but I know that like, when you are starting a company, and they always say that slow growth is like the best growth, um, when you're going after your first series, what's like, the typical number of like, revenue you should show, or your projection, or like, what's something that's like, going to peak like, interest amongst these venture capital firms? Um, well, I think when you're ra you know, you're, the first round you raise will be a seed round where you have no revenue at all. 
So once you've gotten past that and you're looking for your Series A, you want to show at least, um, I would say, you know, something like a million dollars in annual recurring revenue. You want to be on that million dollar run rate. Um, so to go from zero to a million is very impressive. And to be able to go from like one to five your next year is like, that's like the type of growth that people get excited about. But I know it takes some time to figure out what is your business model, build a product, and well, actually probably build the product first, then f figure out your business model, and then start to bring in revenue and show that. Does it not matter if you're profitable at that point? Oh, no, no, no. No one expects you to be profitable until much later. Now, that's why you have to raise the funding, is that you need the funding to fund the burn. Um, but you want to have a path to revenue as soon as, as possible. Like you don't want to, um, there, was a, you know, there was a period of time where the freemium model was all the rage. And everybody said, well, you know, we'll give our products away for free and eventually we'll figure out revenue. It's a lot harder to do that now. What's the percentage of, you said you don't, the companies that have like large burn rates, like what's the percentage that you should keep it under? Um, you know, it's very, it's very case specific. I mean, I think a lot of it depends on how much money you're able to raise. The key thing is that you always want to have 18 months of cash in the bank. That's kind of a good rule of thumb, thumb is that you want 18 months of cash. Thank you. Yeah, I read this book, Predictable Revenue. Um, Aaron Ross says he took their business from zero to 100 million. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us that, that story? <laughs> Well, Aaron Ross worked for me for a year, actually, at Salesforce. I was his, that was his last job as he was working in M&A. And he, um, but before he worked for me, he built out an inside sales team that made outbound phone calls uh, to prospects and would help, uh, and it was, he, de he did develop that. And it was basically, um, you know, a really, really effective tool to, uh, prospect for new business over the phone in a very efficient way. Um, that's what he did for us. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what more is in there. Um, I, can't, I can't really answer about that. But well, the inside, inside sales is, is super important. I mean, like you wanna have a, there, there, there's a type of software, all, you know, we fundamentally believe that all software probably has to be sold. There's very little software that can be self-service, but you know, the companies that do have a great self-service model, like a SurveyMonkey um, or MailChimp is another good example, like those are amazing businesses because they can bring in millions of dollars in revenue without ever having to pay a salesperson anything. But when you want to sell to an enterprise company, you're going to, have, you're going to need a salesperson to do that. It's just, it, it just a requirement. But when you're selling to smaller companies, you can have a very efficient sales force that does it all over the phone. And, um, but the key is that productivity. They have to have the minimum amount of touches with the customer and be able to close the deals quickly or it's not gonna pay itself back. Um, so that's what Aaron developed for us. Um, sorry, you Yeah, uh, the companies that you mentioned that are like service companies, are those all SaaS companies? that you guys have acquired or? No, they're, they are services companies. They are, uh, they are people who go in and advise a company on what they should be doing and get paid uh, by billable hour. So those are, it's a services model. It's, right now it's less than 10% of our revenue. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a much low, services businesses are in general <coughs> much lower margin businesses. They usually run at break even or to a 20% margin, somewhere in the, in the middle. Whereas, you know, software business at scale can run at like an 80% gross margin uh, and, uh, and, you know, can be a very profitable business. But my point in all that is when your company gets large enough, you have to have a services component. It's almost mm -hmm. a requirement uh, when you're selling the large companies. So, you would, uh, so as far as Salesforce Ventures go, you mentioned that you invest off of your guys' balance sheet. Um, say you guys made a series of like of poor investments. Do the shareholder, the preferred shareholders, get any sort of say? Are they consulted and like the companies you invest in, or how does that process? 
Uh, well, we are preferred shareholders. When we make an investment, we take preferred stock. And we, are, we become a preferred shareholder in that company. And so, uh, so if a company doesn't do well, I mean, we've actually, there's only one, of all the investments, we've made over 200 investments, there's only one company where we lost our money. Everyone, every other company that's had an exit, we've at least gotten our money back. Um, and that's because we get paid first. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about nobody really expects to gain profit until the very later stage. So what about the company, which small companies, which already has certain level of profitability, does it attract a extra attention? They do, but then I'd question kind of why, you know, if the goal is growth and you're trying to grow your company and the, the, the more a company grows, the higher their valuation will be, you know, an early stage company, you don't want to be too profitable. You want to make sure that you're reinvesting in the business and growing it um, because that's, that, you know, you want to be growing at 100% at least year over year when you're a little company. That's what you want to achieve. And so just, just you know, hoarding the profits and, and putting it in the bank, it, it's not a good investment in the future. That's never going to, you know, it's, it's unlikely that that will turn into a big business. You want to keep reinvesting in the business until you hit a certain level. Maybe when you have, <coughs> excuse me, when you have $50 million in revenue and you're thinking about going public at the $100 million level, you know, you want to be profitable when you're public. So that's the point in time where you want to think about, okay, what's my path to getting profitable so I will have a successful IPO? But investors now, they want to see, when you go public, they want to see that you'll be profitable within four quarters. Okay? Go ahead. Um, it's, it's more like a, a valuation. Um, I think that most people make up their valuations like when they are looking for seeds. So, and in terms of like, you know, like your projection and all that, like what is the best way to, to go about doing that? Because some people will put like unrealistic like market size and market cap like I, I think that's why it's kind of like, Well, you have to, you've got to paint the picture that there's a big market opportunity for any investor. So, you know, no one, no one wants to invest in a company that's going to be little. Like you want, they want to invest in a company that's going to be big. And so the market opportunity has to be there. And so that always, those, those, those slides where you show what's the total addressable market are really important in your presentation pitch to an investor. But when it comes to the actual setting of the valuation, you know, when you have no revenue, it is completely made up. I mean, completely made up. And it's all, it's all about what percentage of the company do you feel like you can give away to investors? Um, and you always want to give the least percentage away that you can get away with to still raise money. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's kind of, that's, those are the, the sort of trade-offs that you have to make. Yeah. But um, you, know, you, need the, you need the early investors to believe in you so that you have a chance to get off the ground. Right, but in terms of like, um, on like a feasible market size, like without sounding like unrealistic, it's like some of the challenges in there. And then, you know, like if you have an idea of how much you want to raise, like you potentially don't want to scare off investors by like asking so much, so like, I mean, like, I guess how do you like break it down into a sense where it's like, you know, this is your go-to-market strategy, but then this is like your market cap, and, and is everywhere in between. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you, you do raise a good point is that you don't want to be too greedy because, you know, you really need their money to be able to start your company and have some early success. Um, so, uh, I don't know, I think you have to, if you have a good idea, most people invest in the idea and the team. You know, what is the quality of the team? Do they believe that the team is hungry, has good experience, knows the market they're entering into, um, and that they're really going to give it their all? Like, that, that's what gets you the money early on. 
Um, so, and that's why you see like proven teams are often able to raise money over and over and over again uh, from investors. So. All right. Any other? Oh, one back there. Uh, for your marketing companies, uh, what type of actions do they do? I guess. Yeah. Could you just go into more depth on what those marketing services that they did were? Uh, sorry. So market. Marketing one of your little bubbles for your oh, okay, so marketing cloud. Okay, so yeah, so that's all about um, helping. So th what the marketing cloud does is it helps our customers communicate and get more revenue out of their customers and, you know, mar and market to them. And so, you know, we have a whole bunch of products that they can use to try to engage with their customers to bring their customers back to buy more. And I think that's kind of the premise of all the investments we make in that space. They all kind of serve that same goal where, the, where, the, where they are helping a company market to their customers and increase their own revenue. Okay. So uh, one of the ideas I'm just pondering right now is a uh, service to gauge the, uh, I guess, market acceptance of a product. Uh, would you consider that to be outside of the, I guess, business or marketing bubble that you would operate in? And where would that likely, I guess, see funding or not? Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's a little bit different because mm -hmm. that's more, that's more of almost a product focused uh, company where you're trying to help, um, you're trying to help develop your product in a way that increases market effectiveness. Um, so I would, I'd probably put that in a different bucket. I'm not sure. We don't, we don't sell that or service that. So I'm not really sure what that is. There is a, um, we have something that uh, called the Idea Exchange at Salesforce, which allows our, our customers, they come in and they uh, give us ideas on what they want to see in our products and they vote on the ideas and the highest voted ideas bubble to the top and things like that. That's the closest thing we have to that. So I am working on an enterprise software, and uh, currently I have a prototype ready. And this is my current situation. So I have asked a, a few client, potential clients, and they saw the demo, they said that they like it, and uh, they want to see that I have both product ready. And then I went to see some uh, investors saying that I have a customer who are interested in this project and uh, I need money to finish to make it into production. Mm -hmm. But this insists that I have to sell it. So they want to see that I sell some uh, like a traction before it makes some money. Right? Mm -hmm. so I can, what is, do you have some suggestion for my current situation? I, without knowing more about what you're trying to sell, what your product is, it's it's hard, it's hard to know. But uh, my product is a natural language <coughs> database that's for enterprise customers. So instead of like using Excel or MySQL, so they can just uh, like type a uh, ask a question like uh, uh, which job like in Manhattan mm -hmm. that's offer something. Like so it's just like you you think of human language to complete that interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, the best thing you can do is get a pilot with a, with a real um, company that tries your software out and then says great things about it. And then you can use that to try to get them to pay for it or use their quotes and their references to get others to pay for it. But, um, but I, I see your predicament is that like you have to prove um, that this is a money making venture before you'll get funding. Uh, how much uh, potential is better than uh, getting invested? Uh, because uh, almost all of students here uh, have a very prominent college degree from the uh, United States. So what do you think about that matter? Uh, I did, I'm sorry, I yes, didn't uh, the question. How much uh, academic credentials, uh, for example, uh, degree from Stanford, better in getting invested? Um, I don't think it matters. I think that it's really about what have you done in your life and what is your idea and 
who are the people that are going to help you get there. I mean, like it's, I think it's, it's hard to raise money if you're just one person. People like to invest in a team. So they want to see a team of, call it four people, who you know, are really passionate and excited about what they're doing. And they have a good, a good idea and they have a big market. And I don't think they care about your credentials so much. They, but they do care that you're ethical and have high integrity and are not going to waste their money. Yes. Uh, you mentioned some, for some of the company you acquired, and for some of the company you acquired, and you, uh, you guys sometimes just integrate uh, their product into your ecosystem mm -hmm. of the platform. So how exactly are you going to do that? So you offer the, their service to your original customer, or uh, what does that really mean? Well, it, it depends on the company. So we, we bought a company a few months ago called Steelbrick that was actually built on our platform. So we were able, within one month of closing the acquisition, we were able to instantly turn the switch on and have our salespeople sell it because it was already built on our platform. And it already was even integrated with our sales cloud. And so it was a very easy, um, that was a very easy process. It had gone through, because it was built on our platform, it had gone through our security review. And so it had all the credibility that you needed to be able to sell it. That's a rare case. Usually what ends up having, happening is we have to shut down, uh, if it's a little company, we shut down sales of the company. We spend, we take a period of time and rewrite the technology or integrate it onto our platform before then we will turn it back on and start selling it again. Um, <clears throat> and then the other extreme is we buy a business like Exact Target that when we bought it was a $350 million revenue business. And so we can't obviously shut that down. We've got to keep that business growing. And, and over a period of time, we build an integration from their platform to our platform. Um, but we're not, you know, it's so big, you can't possibly rewrite what they're doing, but you have to make sure that there's tight integration so that the data can flow back and forth very easily. I just want to follow up on that. What if you later find out it's not a good fit that for your original? Uh, well, you know, you, you hope that you don't make those mistakes and you certainly, you, try, you do your due diligence on the technology and on the company and the business and the, the people before you buy it so that hopefully you don't make that mistake. And you certainly don't want to make that mistake on anything big. Um, but sometimes when it's a small company that's a little bit more unproven and the founders have less experience, I mean, you just, you, you, you are taking that risk. You don't really know how it's going to perform. <coughs> and we used to, you know, sometimes uh, people talk about having earnouts. Do you know what an earnout is? Where you buy a company, you really don't know how the company is going to do, and so you give them some amount of money up front, but then if the performance is really great, they get to earn extra money down, down the road. That's what's called an earnout. Um, and we don't do that. We, we did it on one transaction, and it's just too difficult to manage that um, you know, typically it's just easier to just take the risk up front uh, by the company and hopefully it works out. Last question. Yes. Are there a limited amount of different uh, companies who offer the same services in your app store? Um, uh, okay, so our app, app store, which we call the App Exchange, oh, okay. yeah, you can have um, uh, multiple companies in the same area can be on the app exchange and they all have the opportunity to go get business from our customers and the hopefully the best company does you know the best on the app exchange sometimes we will invest in you know two companies that are in the same space on the app exchange because we don't know which one will do better or one might service more enterprise companies and others might service more small businesses and we've got to be able to service all customers. And so that's why we might do that on the investment side. But <clears throat> we can, you know, there are lots of companies on the app exchange where we might have invested in a company in their space, but they're still doing really well in our ecosystem, even though we invest in another one. So there, I have lots of examples of that too. Because at the end of the day, we have, you know, almost 200,000 customers and, you know, they have lots of different needs and different desires of what they want to buy. All right, well, thank you very much.